All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Matt Curtis. This is Smart City Policy Stories. Uh, I'm the founder of Smart City Policy Group, but prior to this, I had a role in Austin, Texas, working in local government. The fellow I'm going to be talking to today has a background in Austin local government as well, but he's gone on to national prominence, talking about energy, talking about smart cities, talking about the future of buildings, transportation, and power. You can read all about it in his book, the future of buildings, transportation, and power. Roger Duncan, former city council member for Austin, Texas, former general manager of Austin Energy, and now working to help the world understand about what we need to do better to grow better cities. Roger, welcome. How are you? I am fine. Thank you, Matt, for inviting me. I really appreciate this. No, of course. I'm gonna. I wrote down a few questions, so I'm gonna have to uh, stare at a few questions from time to time. But you were lucky uh, in a way because I think so many of us were attracted to Austin for one reason or another. We came here for one some reason, one reason or another. And what do you know? It really became the world's it city, and you helped pilot that uh, both as a policymaker and then uh, as someone implementing policy and helping drive uh, the uh, intersection of policy and politics here uh, for so long. Uh, quick thought on, on Austin, and I might come back and ask you a few questions about Austin, but where do you think, uh, how do you think we're doing? Where do you think we're going? Uh, actually, I think we're doing very well. And I think just about everybody in the country thinks also that we're doing very well, and that's good. Um, uh, where we're going, uh, we face a lot of the same problems that every big city face in our stage of development. It's really hitting us hard on things like uh, homelessness and the climate change impacts uh, and so forth. And, um, but I think we're in the fortunate position that we'll weather it better than most and uh, our policies are heading in the right direction. Yeah, I know. And so much of that is because of the people who are building those policies in place uh, years and years ago, which includes you. You guys did a great job. And even when I was a young man growing up here, uh, I knew that Austin was a, a great city and was going to continue to be a great city uh, and grow into a greater and greater city. Well, talking about the future of cities, mm -hmm. the future of buildings, transportation and power. One of the things with this book, first off, great book, easy to read, especially for someone with just a uh, basic uh, uh, low-level party school uh, graduation or, or uh, college degree like mine, uh, but it was fun. It was very enjoyable, uh, and I recommend it, especially for people who are dealing with these issues, local government folks, but also private sector folks that want to engage in these discussions. You kick off the book pretty quickly talking about energy efficiency, mm -hmm. uh, talking about kind of the, the, the convergence of new energy efficiencies. Can you speak to that a little, what you're, what you're referring to? Well, um, actually I started my political career and so in the area of energy efficiency and energy conservation and the idea that we could do everything we're doing and convert less energy. And as I've gotten into it further on the, over the years, I realized it's really it's the basis of all our technology is the idea of converting anything from one form to another with efficiency, that is less total energy conversion, whether it's materials or motion or time or whatever. And that really drives our technological development, including the basic ones of buildings, transportation and power, which is what cities are really about in terms of technology. Yeah, and buildings are becoming more efficient. You guys have some you know, great dive into that. Uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, how they're becoming more efficient uh, on their own. But one of the things I was fascinated to notice is that you talked about the construction of building is becoming more efficient, that we're using robots and we're using 3D printing. Now, at wow. first, I think to many people who might not be aware of this, uh, that might be new. Until you go around some of these new construction sites and see giant signs that say, caution, large robots at work, or some sign acknowledging that part, part or all of the construction is 3D printing. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, I think that's the exciting development that's taking place in uh, building construction now. Uh, as you mentioned, more and more of the processes are becoming automated uh, individually, everything from uh, uh, slab construction to uh, manufacturing the buildings and transporting them from uh, uh, warehouses and such. And, uh, 
and it's becoming more intelligent uh, in the precision and the speed that it takes place. And so uh, buildings are going to be taken down and constructed much faster in the future. And it seems like you can almost see them speeding up now. Uh, and the combination of artificial intelligence and robotics that go into that construction is going to be transformative. And 3D printing uh, in particular is going to transform the building industry. Uh, we have an example of a company in Austin, Icon, that 3D prints affordable housing, uh, small housing that can be mass produced uh, very quickly and very cheaply. And, um, and in China, they have these huge 3D printers that will uh, print a, a reasonable size building in a day. It's just amazing. It, incredible for those of us who remember that a 3D printer or a printer used to make a crazy sound and slowly go back and forth across the paper going, you know, you know it's, it's, it's just amazing how quickly this has moved along. Now, you also speak at length about, uh, or write at length about uh, buildings making better use of renewable energy, uh, building practices becoming more sustainable, like moving towards zero net uh, carbon status. Um, you know, is that something that we're going to see continue to escalate here in the in the immediate future? Oh, yes. I think that uh, I think that the installation of on site uh, solar generation and uh, renewable resources is going to accelerate at a tremendous speed in the coming uh, two decades, uh, really, because we're at an automated stage again with that. Uh, the manufacturer of solar cells is almost completely automated now. And uh, we're getting closer and closer to installation being partially or mostly automated. And with those factors in place, the price is plummeting even further. And I think all the conditions are there for a very rapid uh, uh, building integrated photovoltaics and such across the building sector. So buildings might be creating their own renewable energy for their building. Uh, and then uh, also just, you know, because of that becoming more sustainable. You also mentioned something amazing, uh, the focus of buildings on urban, uh, kind of growing urban forests mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and maybe even potentially sustaining some degree of urban farming. Is that something we're gonna see in cities uh, in our lifetime? Oh, oh yes, and it's all, we already have examples of it, uh, uh, not so much in the US, but in France and in China and, and uh, a few places in the US, uh, we see that the owners of large, uh, tall buildings realizes that a terrace feature there can sustain a lot of wildlife, trees and bushes and, and such. And uh, it is an exciting new development and they, they talk about it in terms of urban forest now because the amount of uh, greenery that's being placed on these buildings is equal to the size of a small forest. Uh, and uh, that's a very exciting development. I look forward to that in Austin. You know, I remember when I was a younger man and, and you were on city staff and I was, I was maybe not even with the city yet. Uh, one of our great champions of the environment in Austin, our mayor pro tem, Jackie Goodman, really studied, uh, and I think was, was at least championing at the council level, uh, the issues related to heat islands in the central corridor in the central business district uh, and that the idea of you know pursuing this type of urban forestry and 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 you know on street uh, sidewalk uh, uh, greater enhancement of urban forestry there uh, is needed one of the things that you mentioned in the book and we certainly have seen this as employers is that that type of amenity also attracts talent people want to be around green space they want to be around some place where they can potentially walk away from their cubicle and go sit outside and still have access to Wi-Fi. Absolutely. And uh, that's certainly one of the main reasons that Austin has become uh, such an it city, I think, is because of the past environmental work of the community that's been done has made it a quality place to live. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in Austin today and almost downtown and there's trees all around me. We have a great urban uh, forest cover. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to be near Barton Springs and, and there are uh, um, 
just a tremendous uh, feeling in your daily life here of it's a great place to be and not in the big city. Right, right. Well, now on transportation, you know, we've heard for years, urban planners or, you know, transportation planners, they're trying to get us out of cars. And with great reason. They're trying to help us find, you know, solutions for transit, maybe build transit-oriented uh, corridors along, you know, transit routes. And the one thing that we've all heard about time and time again is that first mile, last mile issue. Yeah. I would argue that a small handful of years ago, three years ago maybe, I don't know that many of us would have ever thought that electric scooters would be in cities all around the country, or that we would be talking about electric vertical takeoff and landing jets, the air taxis that are soon going to be connecting us regionally uh, at an affordable level. Um, what do cities need to be doing to better embrace new uh, transportation innovations uh, so that they can close that first mile, last mile gap, uh, you know, obviously help build a more sustainable community and support that uh, smart, more smartly planned community? Well, um, that's uh, a difficult and long question. <laughs> and so I, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have a good feel for all the policies that, and, and such that they need to be addressing. But I think that the important thing is to realize the different types of, of the past problems that they have. Uh, we're not getting rid of congestion, but we have new types of congestion problems such as air congestion now with the, uh, uh, like you mentioned, the vertical takeoff and landing of vehicles adding to helicopters now in Austin a lot and uh, drones coming in uh, for deliveries and so forth. Um, uh, so they're going to be dealing with congestion in, in different areas. They're going to be dealing with uh, power and supply issues in different areas that they hadn't dealt with before. Um, but it's um, the integration of those is a difficult general problem that uh, they've got to put some thinking think tank on. And be aware of it. You know, I think that's the first thing you started to say, just being uh, knowledgeable that these technologies are coming. You, you opened my eyes to one I didn't know about, which seems so smart for us, a major intersection or interstate going right through the middle of our city, like so many cities, mm -hmm. uh, to reduce potentially uh, the amount of individual freight vehicles. This concept of platooning yes. uh, freight, is that, that's entirely new to me. And the fact that since we're moving more towards AI, to artificial intelligence, that a platoon of freight vehicles might be driven without a driver. Uh, right, or you know, maybe even one driver for several vehicles just at the beginning. Um, uh, yes, and I think that autonomous freight delivery in general is going to be where we see the autonomous vehicle movement going short term. There's all this publicity about driverless cars and the safety of them and, and driverless vehicles with a person in them in an urban environment is an extremely difficult problem uh, to work out in its entirety. Right. Uh, doing autonomous vehicles first for freight delivery and automation, uh, often you can have pre-designed routes and uh, safeguards to make that faster and easier. And then things like platooning where you can lock together many autonomous vehicles and streams and such is a much easier first step in automation than true driverless vehicles on the highway. And I think that you'll see that portion of the electrification of the transportation sector and the autonomy of it uh, move the quickest. Wow, it, just incredible. Uh, and you know, it's so easy for us to know that this is happening because we're in a town that uh, Tesla has invested more. Um, it seems like every time you turn around, there's another Tesla project being built in Austin. And it's yeah. all, you know, somewhat related to autonomous, certainly new innovative technologies. Well, finally, you know about our grid and about our power. Uh, here we are, you and I, just a couple months after we faced this huge state power problem. All of Texas or a massive portion of Texas was hit with a pretty challenging uh, you know, power concern. Many of us lost power for a period of time. Uh, it was a weather-related uh, 
issue, probably a lot of different things intersecting all at once. But what do we need to be doing to think about the future of power, power generation, power supply for our cities? Well, uh, there are several things. Uh, one is uh, diversifying our, our fuel sources and, and our, our means of generation. Um, one of the fires, problems with our modern power systems is it's very complex and it's one machine. And when part of it goes down, the whole thing can go down for long periods of time. And one of the, the trends that we're seeing in power in addition to moving to cleaner sources of energy is moving to decentralization and microgrids and on-site generation. And uh, I think that is one of the trends we need to accelerate uh, and integrate into our planning that'll make our cities more resilient. Uh, and, um, you know, any city today that is depending more and more on technology, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, et cetera, and so forth, um, needs to have a strong contingency plan for when the power goes out. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a backup system for maintaining basic services when the electricity goes out, uh, you're going to be in trouble a number of times, I think. And microgrids and on-site generation um, is a, uh, uh, an approach, I think, that cities could use quite successfully to become more resilient uh, to these kind of outages. So it seems like in, in a situation with microgrids, if there was a problem in a grid, you could isolate it to just that small grid and not impact your entire city. And what we saw in so many different large neighborhoods in, uh, in Austin, and then of course throughout Texas, is massive grids were being impacted, probably for issues that could have been addressed easily if, if, if we did have microgrids. Yes, and in addition to microgrids, the utility could do a better job, frankly, of sectionalizing the circuit uh, so that you could do rolling blackouts. You really couldn't do them this time because you didn't have the hospitals and the fire station and the essential basic services on a small enough circuit uh, that you could isolate it and then do a rolling brownout of the other circuits. I've never heard so many uh, uh, people who went to a uh, third tier uh, party school along with me who suddenly became grid experts then during our, our blackout. You had people telling me what grid we were on and I was sitting there saying, but but you studied marketing at the same college that I went to. Yeah, we all received a very quick education in, uh, in fire grids. But then, you know, also the uh, being able to do greater generation, you know, in individual neighborhoods seems like something that could be something we could see in our, in our lifetimes as well, that we could generate our own neighborhood energy. Well, yes, uh, you know, actually the largest microgrid in the United States is here in Austin. It's the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a microgrid running off natural gas and the whole UT center core of the city is a microgrid. Wow. And so that would, we could certainly expand that concept, uh, particularly to, uh, combined uh, residential office complexes and so forth of larger acreage. Yeah. Now, uh, switching gears again, just real quick, talk about Austin for a quick moment. Um, you know, you've seen Austin over the last 40, 40 plus years uh, since you've been here. Uh, some would see it as you've seen the city since the days of the Armadillo World Headquarters. Great mm -hmm. live music of mm -hmm. that era to where we are today. You hear folks mention we may have jumped the shark. Some people, like myself, believe Austin is a state of mind. Events uh, or venues come and go, restaurants come and go, they always have. But we're still the same state of mind. Uh, how do you feel about the city of Austin, where we've been and where we're going? Well, I came here over 50 years ago, actually. Wow. When I arrived in Austin, there were two tall buildings in town, the State Capitol and the UT Tower. That was it. And so I have seen just a tremendous urbanization uh, and expansion of the uh, environment in Austin. Um, but you're certainly right, uh, at least among the people that I know and deal with, the um, sort of laid back attitude that uh, there was when 
you know, the big store downtown was a feed store, uh, is still there in a lot of respects. And uh, it, it, it feels like a good community to me. And I don't know if it feels that way in other cities. I've never had that experience, but uh, it does still feel like Austin unique uh, after all these years. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we, um, we, in, you know, when I, when I still think about where we've been and where we're going, it seems like we're driven by the people uh, mm -hmm. and just by a, a fun mindset. Uh, yeah. And people want to do things a little differently and at our own speed. Yeah. Well, you have certainly helped drive that for 50 plus years here, uh, Roger. Can you just tell us before, before we, we, we let you go, did you have a favorite time in Austin, a period in Austin where you felt like for you, things were magical? Was it a, a, a one, one, one night at a music venue where you got to see a, a, a you know, band that you wouldn't have otherwise seen? Or was it just a, maybe a period of time? Well, that's hard to uh, that's hard to answer because as I think about it, I think of several times that I think was my favorite time in Austin. I certainly loved my college years here, and like you say, the Armadillo World headquarters and and uh, the hippie days and the first Earth Day in Austin. I think is what uh, inspired me to devote my career to environmental causes, and. Um, and so the whole environmental movement in Austin has provided just moments of, uh, of gratitude and feel good and, and uh, great to be in Austin. What was that first Earth Day like? Oh, the first Earth Day was, uh, was wonderful. Uh, and of course on the UT campus, there were a lot of us hippies uh, supporting uh, the Earth. Uh, but for the first time, you know, people were saying things and you were thinking about things that you just hadn't thought about in terms of environmental impact. Yeah. Uh, and, and just the whole idea that, hey, we should be concerned about the natural, uh, this is move, you know, this could go away. We're destroying this right now. That really hadn't been in any kind of consciousness uh, before then that I recall. Yeah. Well, and we can save it. We can do so much for the environment by planning for a great future for our cities and for the future of buildings, uh, transportation, and power. So for everybody, pick up a copy of Roger Duncan's book. He co-wrote this with Michael Weber. It's called The Future of Buildings, Transportation, and Power. I loved it. You will, too. Thank you so much, Roger Duncan. We sure do appreciate you. Thank you very much.